Will you please join me in the morning prayer? God of love and light, we come before you as people wishing to honor you with worship and song. Accept our worship service, bless our people, and grant us the imagination we need to move forward according to your will. As we see the effects of the pandemic decline, we are filled with hope. We give you thanks for having granted us the resolve and determination to do all that was necessary to stay safe and healthy. Lead us forward now as we gather our people and remember the ways of this church and move forward. We ask for your blessing upon those among us who are frail or challenged with new health issues. We include in our prayer our friends and our followers that all their hopes come true. We send our blessing across the airwaves to those at a distance sharing in our worship service. May they feel your presence and our support in all that we all attempt to do. Grant us the strength and blessing we share as people who are able to gather in person. We pray for your blessing upon our children. May their wisdom grow with them. May they return in full confidence of their abilities and their growth toward their call to be servants of Christ. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us wholeheartedly join together and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us prepare for the first scripture reading. Today's first scripture reading is from Psalms 1. You can find it in the Pew Bibles or in the bulletin or on the screen. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or set in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Thank you. Our gospel reading today comes from Luke chapter 6 verses 17 through 26. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jer Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And in all the crowd they were trying to touch him for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. 
Woe to you when you all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. May God bless this reading of God's holy word. I think what's more famous, what we've all heard about, are the Beatitudes in the Gospel of Matthew, offered by Jesus during his Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5 of Matthew begins with Jesus listing all the ways that we ought to be. We hear that we are blessed for living out virtues, like being peacemakers and being merciful, and a longer list of virtues worthy of blessing, including the blessing upon those who suffer in their, this life. In the Gospel of Luke, however, the sermon is known as the Sermon on the, plain, on the Plains. And we find only four such blessings followed by four woes. They have an order in which they flow, so listen carefully when you hear them. They go from blessing to reversal, and the, and the woes go from woe to reversal. For example, when I am empty, the blessing is I will be filled. But once full, then I will be emptied. So it's a back and forth. Our first impulse when we read these blessings and these woes is to do a self-check, isn't it? To see where we stand. What do we amount to? Are we guilty in some way? We look for whether we're worthy of God's blessing or of God's judgment. And guess what? We find out pretty quickly that it's a mixed bag. We do not fit neatly into either category. We're guilty of both, some on both sides. And that's exactly the point Jesus is trying to make today. That we may be virtuous in many ways, but we are also sinful, and that our task in life is to admit the duality of our human nature and to manage it with the help of Jesus' teachings. We may not realize that we live in a constant state of tension between God's blessing and God's judgment. The only hope for us is to follow Jesus through his teachings and by his example. But Jesus is wise enough to know that he cannot spread his teaching without help. By now, in the scriptures, in Luke, he has gained the attention of multitudes. Many have become his disciples. But others are still curious and followed, Luke says, to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Some were healed instantly as soon as they touched him. But Jesus has also just selected, if you look at the previous chapter, just selected his 12 disciples. 12 particular people, 12 disciples, to coincidentally represent the 12 tribes of Israel. As a reminder that Jesus emerged from the 12 tribes that were first blessed into being by God. Jesus was born a Jew. Jesus does not and cannot stand in opposition to Israel because he is a continuation of that original blessing, expanded now to include Gentiles. The 12 disciples Jesus has selected realize suddenly that now they are being called to be apostles as well. And we know apostles travel to spread the teachings of Jesus. Do they feel daunted by this sudden change in responsibility? They too, like us, must live in the tension of achieving two opposing goals at the same time. How do they follow Jesus and yet go ahead of Jesus? How do we live in the, the virtuous life and yet face the danger of having our virtue stand in our way? That, my friends, is the reality of living the cross-shaped life, always being pulled in two directions. We can never really feel relieved or congratulate ourselves that we've achieved the goal of being Christ-like. But we are called to be vigilant, if we look at our congregation as a microcosm of the life of Christian living in community, you can see this tension played out in one particular way that I've noticed. 
Think about that virtuous person who is so good at accomplishing things quickly and efficiently that they, out of the goodness of their hearts, assume the responsibility of the majority of tasks because they're good at it. They do it quickly. It's efficient, and that's a blessing. But what's the judgment? That others who are also equipped and gifted aren't seeing the need anymore. And they can be part of the whole scheme of church work. We can work dutifully and yet humbly in tandem with those who may be slower at reacting or less efficient or less talented. But that's where the tension lies. We have to move forward in our spiritual growth together as if we were all work, walking arm in arm. Some will move slower, and some will help those who are moving slower to keep up the pace. And that is authentic community. Jesus' 12 disciples will move onward in twos to communities that haven't heard Jesus' teachings yet. Will they do a good enough job, we wonder, without Jesus there to lead them, or remind them, or train them? Or will they simply do their best and know that God is aware of their limitations. Is that also a model we can follow? Not everyone has training to help teach new members about the Christian life. Do we simply put ourselves on the line and do the best we can? Jesus is offering his disciples the opportunity to do something difficult that they may not feel ready to do? Do we realize that even though it appears to be a daunting task, spreading the word is still our business? Not only do we have the task of advancing the cause of Jesus, but we now have the added responsibility of holding the line against decline. Because we Christians may have lost our credibility along the way. More than concern about funds to keep churches afloat or concerns about filling the pews is the question of being credible followers of Christ who are capable of holding the interest of people who might be curious about Christianity. Those who make up the multitudes, we are in the minority. We are called to live in the tension of understanding that we need the people who are hungry. We need those who revile us for our Christian ways. We need to learn from the depressed and the downtrodden because they have much to teach us. We can see ourselves in them just as they can see their reflections, reflections of themselves in our eyes. We can offer those we see as disadvantaged an arm and help them gradually move forward in life which sometimes may slow us down. And they may do for us the service of removing any self-satisfaction we may be tempted to enjoy. Jesus has taught us by his example that there is no need for celebrating success. So let's rethink the efforts of our much-loved and much-respected church. Let's pray more about the integrity of all that we do in service to our world. How are we opening ourselves in ways that change us into more Christ-like figures? Are we able to answer questions for people who want to know more about the Christian life or the Christian faith? Can we answer questions about why we became Christians beyond the I was born into it statement? Can we answer questions on why anyone would want to become a follower of Christ? Have we given much thought to dwelling on such questions for ourselves? Where do we stand with these questions? It isn't just enough to invite someone to visit our church. The why is the big question. And does your character and life demonstrate your why? Let's look at the attitude with which Jesus began his ministry. He went up to pray in the mountain before he came down to a level place to address the crowd that was gathering, hence Sermon on the Plains. 
he knew his task was something he couldn't do alone or shouldn't attempt on his own. Notice how Luke punctuates his account of Jesus with time spent alone in prayer. Don't you wonder what Jesus prayed about? Does he need his father's assurance for courage and confidence? Is he wise enough to realize that he needs all the help he can get? Does private prayer perhaps fill him with new insight and clarity? Because every time he disappears to pray, to spend time alone in prayer with his father, his ministry seems to gain momentum or take a fresh new turn. As Jesus begins his Sermon on the Plains, the very first beatitude he states is, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Poverty is a way of life that persists even today. The poor are those who are unable to help themselves. Their only hope is to turn to God. God has a preferential love for the poor because they are living in ways that are contrary to God's will. Those who do not identify with the poor may feel guilty about their escape from poverty, many of us. And we may feel especially blessed. But ask yourself, can these blessings of such of people like us block the blessings of others? Cross-shaped living would require that fortunate people examine their hearts and reprioritize their lives with the needs of the poor in mind. How does this fit the Christian ethic of being good stewards? That's at odds there. How much wealth is too much? Who knows? How can we transfer our wealth responsibly? Is it even possible? Do you see how impossible it is to live the cross-shaped life? As impossible as it seems, that is our call. Let's join together in prayer. Almighty God, we are humbled today by the, pr the trust Jesus places in his disciples, as he does in us. Be with us in our efforts to spread the good news of Christ. Give us the words to share. Grant us the courage to go into the unknown. And fill us with the love we need to share with those who despair. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.